Thank you very much, Deborah. It's a, just a pleasure to be here and talk to all of you today about six Spanish varieties. Um, <clears throat> my family is from Spain on my mother's side. Bocas would never let you know that. But uh, we're all from Spain, from the Catalonia area, and we have Tempranillo named Ull de Llebre, and we have Cariñen, and we have Garnacha, and we have a lot of really interesting varieties over there. But my history is that of California, and in an attempt to marry my history from Spain with my history from California, we decided to grow grapes that weren't just Merlot, Cabernet, Chardonnay, although we grow a lot of Merlot, Cabernet, and Chardonnay as well. So um, you have in front of you an 18-page handout that goes into great detail on the six varieties. So you don't need to take a lot of notes. In fact, what you're going to see on the slides is a condensed version of what you have in front of you. Also, you have that postcard that we handed out just to embellish a little bit more on what Deborah said. On the 14th of June, there is going to be a tapas Spanish varietal tasting, and the focus will be entirely on North American Spanish varieties and uh, there should be producers from California, Arizona, Oregon. In fact, there'll be somewhere close to 40 producers pouring wine, so it should be a very exciting event. So these are the six varieties that we're gonna be talking about, and the dish to your right was what we should have had for lunch. Oh, but never mind. <laughs> In any event, we have Alvarinho, and the Portuguese name Alvarinho, Verdello, Garnacha Blanca, those will be the three whites that we'll talk about. And then we're going to talk about three reds. And I say reds, uh, maybe perhaps I shouldn't say reds. In fact, I didn't even give one of them the benefit of having a full red pigmentation. And that is Garnacha Tinta, because it has some pigment issues. Then we have Graciano and Tempranillo. So we're going to go pretty thoroughly through those six varieties. We actually do grow Monastrel or Movedra and uh, make a bottling of it, but uh, we decided, I decided to focus just on these six today. One of the things before I go on though that I'd like to mention is that in all of the talks that were so far done today, you'll notice a commonality of experience both in Spain and Portugal and also in Mendocino. And I'm glad to report to you that my experience in District 11, which is the Lodi Woodbridge, uh, the Lodi AVA, uh, we find great commonalities with the experiences both in Europe and in the North Coast. So these are the topics that we're going to cover. The first thing is going to be just a little description of the vineyards that we have of these different varieties. Secondly, we'll go into the phenology of those vines and we're going to compare them to varieties that you may be more familiar with. Thirdly, we're going to go a little bit into the vine architecture, what do the canes look like, leaves, clusters, berries, etc. And then we're going to talk in general about varietal characteristics of these six different varieties. Uh, the um, organoleptic properties, the aromas, flavors, textures are going to be touched upon. And then finally we'll do a tasting. Now you're welcome to sniff the glasses and even taste the glasses if you want. I'll let you know right now that what you have in front of you, the two wines to the left are Albarino, the two wines to the right are Graciano. The two Albarinos come from two distinct terroirs in Lodi, and the two Gracianos come from those two very same distinct terroirs in Lodi. Again, we'll get more vineyard information at the latter part of the talk, but by all means, go ahead and sniff around and, and enjoy it as we're talking. So, Albarino, Rias Baixas. The uh, selection that I have in my vineyards, in fact, originated from the Rias Baixas and made its way to the Penedes region, the Alt Penedes in the late 80s. And I happened to be in that area in the early 90s, uh, working with uh, two different companies in Spain, and was able to get familiar with this variety in a region that was not of its origin. And it's really funny in Spain, because and Jesus mentioned this earlier, but there's these 17 autonomous regions, and they're very autonomous, and every region thinks that they perhaps produce the best wines, or they know how to make it the best way, etc. And so it was really funny for these Catalans to accept the fact that Albarino is such a wonderful variety that comes from a foreign area, which of course is Spain, just a different part of Spain. And uh, so we brought uh, this cutting in in 1999. We didn't bring a cutting, we brought many cuttings. We first did all our disease testings that were requisite to making sure we weren't introducing any dangerous plant material. And then in 2001, uh, we went ahead and uh, donated it to the university, and it is known as FPS. Zero 01. And uh, it is provisional right now. It's uh, soon to be registered and available to the industry as yet another opportunity to uh, look at uh, diversity within, uh, within a particular varietal. Now, 
when I say diversity within a particular varietal, what I mean is that what you have, what, what I have in my vineyard is a selection. It is a heterogeneous population of cuttings that came from a very heterogeneous vineyard in the Penedes that had come from several cuttings that had come from the Rios Baixas. What the university collected was an accession. They took a piece of wood, or two or three, but ultimately what FPS 01 is for the Albarino is essentially a very homogenous clone of Albarino. Now whether that makes any difference or not is yet to be determined. We have years of study before we determine whether there's really any greater complexity in a heterogeneous population of Albarino, such as what I have in my vineyard versus the accession 01 from Davis. Uh, you'll notice there are three vineyards that we have. The first one is the Las Cerezas Vineyard. That is our mother block, if you will. It's on a Toque fine uh, silt loam. The Toque series has both sandy and silty components to it. We're on a silt loam. It's on 10114 rootstock, and it was planted in 1999. The Terra Alta Vineyard and the Vista Luna Vineyard, they are located on similar soils, Redding gravelly clay loams. They're both on 5BB. The Terra Alta was grafted in 2004. The Vista Luna was planted in 2006. Uh, what you're going to be tasting later on will be the Las Cerezas and the Terra Alta. So you can see the different soil types. A little bit about the phenology. <clears throat> Albarino is a very early variety for all of the phenological stages. And it's wonderful in that respect. Uh, it bud breaks early, it blooms early, it early verasion. In fact, it started doing verasion just, um, uh, excuse me, it, did, it started doing flowering just a couple of days ago. I think it was probably closer to the 10th of May uh, when the first uh, flowers started emerging. Um, and it harvests early, uh, generally about mid to late August. Last year, of course, in 2008, and you'll notice this in all the phenology that we talk about with every variety, everything is earlier in 2008 by between 10 to uh, 10 days to two weeks. So when you look at that number, for example, here the 3rd of August, keep that in mind that that might not be as, as usual. Probably a closer harvest date would be closer to the mid to latter part of August for Albarino. It's very similar to Verdello in its flowering, and it's very similar to Pinot Gris. So those of you who have Pinot Gris, I think you can know what to expect in terms of these uh, phenological events. It is ahead of Chardonnay, and it is ahead of the Garnacha Blanca and the Garnacha Tinta by about a week. This is what the shoot tip looks like. It has a lot of pubescence or hair on both the top and the bottom of the shoots, of, of the leaves. It's a very interesting variety to see growing. It has a very wispy canopy. And part of that is because it has long and thin inner nodes. It just reaches up vertically and grows very quickly in the beginning part of the season. It has very few laterals or secondaries, that, or secondary crop that pushes it all. The leaves are, on top of being on this very thin, long cane, the leaves are round and small. They're unlobed. They're kind of lime green in color, and I've got a couple more pictures on the next slide that'll show you that. And the petioles are relatively long. Now, if the petioles had been short, it would have led to a little bit denser of a canopy. So here you have these long inner nodes, these long petioles, and it just uh, really makes for a kind of a wispy canopy. Uh, the clusters, they're small, they're oval, they're generally wingless. They're somewhat loose and they're thick skinned and they have a very thick cuticle which gives them a grayish appearance. So you can imagine that here's this variety that's growing in a region that has over 50 inches of rainfall. It's continuously green and it has this very open loose canopy with small thick leaves and clusters that are very resilient to fungal attack because of the thickness of the cuticle and the skin. So it kind of makes sense that it would work well in Galicia and Northern Portugal. Here's a leaf on the left-hand side, a mature leaf. And on the right-hand side, you'll see another mature leaf with a standard-looking cluster of Albarino. Before we get too much into the organoleptic qualities, I wanted to talk to you about a few of the things that I think are important with Albarino. Um, we generally spur prune it to two buds, and the clusters are small, so for us to get even around 4 tons of the acre, we really need to get the bud count up. And our bud counts are generally around 28,000 to 35,000 buds per acre, depending on the spacing. So the Las Ceresas vineyard is on a 5x5 five five spacing. It's very tight and small. We have about 35,000 buds per acre. The uh, Terra Alta vineyard is 8x7, and uh, consequently about 28,000 
butts per acre. And yet, that only gives us between three and four tons to the acre. I think that in the future, what I would do with this variety is experiment with cane pruning. It's, it's, uh, it throws a lot of clusters out. It's uh, very fruitful. It doesn't have any issues with shatter, but it would be a way to, to probably perhaps balance the crop and, uh, and definitely the, because of the size of the clusters, cane pruning would be ideally suited to Albrino. So that would be something that you all should consider if planting it. I'll definitely do it myself in the next vineyard. Uh, it does have, and of course we're in Lodi and we get these northerly winds that come barreling down the valley in April and in, in early May, and it is susceptible to wind damage. Again, long, thin, spindly shoots hanging high in the air. So movement of wires early is a good idea. It's a low vigor variety. As you can see, we planted it on 101.14 and 5BB. In hindsight, I think I would want to experiment with some higher vigor varieties as well, such as 110R and 1103 Paulson. Uh, it doesn't seem to have a lot of susceptibility to sunburn, even though the clusters are hanging out there and readily visible from almost any direction. And I think this is because of the thick cuticle, it's the thick skin, and also the tendency to pick early. We don't have to do any leaf pulling on this variety. And one, I think, really interesting thing is that we used to harvest by flavor. We'd wait until we get these delicious flavors and then we'd pick, and we'd be at around 23 and a half bricks. And I think that that is a mistake for at least my region. And that's simply because by the time you pick by flavor, you're gonna be in the mid-23s, which is too high in, in my estimation. The acids are still okay, but uh, when you ferment Albarino, and we stainless steel ferment it, no barrel aging, and we use slow fermentation, cold fermentation, you're not blowing a lot of alcohol off, you're getting a very efficient conversion, and you end up with alcohols that are close to 14. And so the wines can get a little awkward. Albrin is supposed to be lower alcohol, crisp, and delicious. So what we're finding is, last year we did it for the first time for the 2008s, is we actually picked by bricks and we were not happy with the flavor development, but we went ahead and did it anyhow, and lo and behold, the flavors emerged. So we're gonna continue doing that with this variety as we go on. Some of the organoleptic qualities or the aromatics, flavors, et cetera, that we have been able to pull out of the wines include, at lower bricks, these beautiful citrus components. In California, it's more mandarin, tangerine, sweet citrus. Uh, I think it'd be more common to get uh, grapefruit and grapefruit rind from Galician examples or cooler California examples. Uh, we also get this beautiful Afajar citrus blossom. It's, a, it's an absolutely beautiful component to the aromatics of Albarino. And the higher bricks, we tend to get more of a Viognier-like characteristic, much more stone fruit, apricot and peach, particularly apricot. Uh, and then if you go really, uh, if you let the vine hang or the grapes hang on the vine too long, you're going to get into lychee and passion fruit, which a little bit is okay. But we had one vineyard that we decided to pick late just as an experiment. And we got banana taffy. I mean, this thing went way off the charts with tropical. So you have to be really careful with, again, not letting your albarinas go too far. In terms of flavors, you get that real nice kind of citrusy, lemony mouthfeel. This is where you can get a little bit of grapefruit rind, a little bit of bitterness that is perhaps from the seeds that at a little quantity is very attractive. And you get this uh, almonds, these fresh almonds as well, like a marzipan too. The texture should be uh, rich without being terribly sweet. Uh, at lower bricks, you get this bright acidity and a lighter style, which is what we're seeking. At higher bricks, you get a little bit of a fattier, more glycerol component. On to Verdello. Now Verdello, there has been a lot of confusion with this name as it's been alluded to on several talks earlier. And I uh, started wondering when I planted my vineyard whether I truly had the real Verdello. And I'm happy to report that uh, the Verdello that we have in our vineyard is in fact a 1999 introduction, not directly into our vineyard, but via another vineyard in the Lodi AVA uh, that uh, came directly from the East Lado Pico in the Azores. And it is a, uh, uh, it came from an area or a block specifically dedicated to Verdello. So we planted our vineyard in 2006 at the Vista Luna site, which is again, redding gravelly clay loam on 5BB rootstock, and uh, it is done for the few vintages that we've had, the one vintage to be precise, uh, it has done really well on that site. So I don't have any uh, phenological data for 2007, but I have what's going on currently in 09, and we have last year's, which again, remember, is about 10 days to two weeks early 
because of the uh, peculiarities of last year. So this, this variety is, again, uh, pretty early for all stages listed below, similar to Albarino, uh, similar to Pinot Gris, and again, earlier than Chardonnay, Garnacha Blanc, and Garnacha, Garnacha Tinta. Some of the characteristics is that this, instead of having long, wispy canes like the Albarino, it tends to have medium length and medium girth canes. It's vigorous, and it has more of a spreading pattern, so it doesn't uh, necessarily accommodate to VSP quite as readily, but it's not that hard. It will push laterals, particularly if it's overly vigorous. Uh, the leaves are bigger than that of the Albarino. They're medium round. They tend to be wavy, undulating, uh, deep green in color, with some pubescence on the bottom of the leaf. The clusters are very loose. Uh, they're laterally growing. The Albarino is more more oval, the, uh, the Verdello tends to, all, many rachises actually have two stems that are about of equal length. So it's very laterally spread. It has a beautiful golden color, medium cuticle, and medium skin thickness. The berries are oval. They're small and oval, and they remain hard all the way to harvest. And the most difficult thing that we discovered last year was even at a low bricks level, like at 22 bricks, uh, when, and the flavors are delicious, you, you harvest the albarino and the berries dislodge from the pedicels very easily. So if you're not careful, you lose a lot of grapes onto the ground. So something to be, uh, and I don't know whether it was the very first year, whether it was particular to 2008, I don't know, I'm going to continue to look at it, but I suspect that it's something that's varietally uh, associated. I don't have a picture of a cluster, but this is a classic picture of a leaf of the Verdello. And a few comments with the Verdello. Again, we two bud spur it to get the tonnages a little bit higher. Again, we're shooting for about four ton to the acre. But unlike Albarino, I think I would stay with cordon pruning on this one. Uh, it is, when it's older, I'm sure it's going to have a greater root system and, and be a little more vigorous even then. So uh, I think in this particular case, when the vine, uh, because it's young and it's rather unsettled at the moment, I think that this vineyard would probably be accommodating to a no-till environment or, a, or, a, or an alternating road tillage environment as opposed to Albarino where we try to till every road to, to make sure that the, that the vine has the appropriate nutrients and waters directly from the soil. The, in the literature, it states that this variety tends to have a little bit of um, uh, susceptibility to frost damage. We have not seen that yet. We haven't had a bad frost in the block yet, but we're going to keep, be keeping our eyes open. This is a variety definitely that we are going to be doing a lot of leaf pulling on. Again, that spreading kind of attitude makes you lose the fruit in the, uh, in the canopy. So pulling leaves, opening it up so that you don't get powdery mildew, and in particular that you get good ripening around the fruit I think is important. Powdery mildew susceptibility, uh, not quite as much as Chardonnay, but definitely to keep your eyes open for. Some of the organoleptic qualities, and this I've purely extracted from the literature and from a couple winemakers who bought fruit from me last year. In the cooler climates, you tend to get, again, uh, this citrus, fresh hay, laurel, and a grassiness. When you get into warmer climates, you get more of that honeysuckle, and then you get into some tropical notes like pineapple and mango, and even some spice. Uh, the flavors, with oak aging, you tend to get a little of that nutty character and some vanillin. And Richard Smart and others have been talking about Verdello as the appropriate other Chardonnay for warmer climates in California. The Australians have definitely been working with this. And it's not surprising then that you get some of these characteristics that could be reminiscent to a Chardonnay. The texture is definitely heavier and weightier than an Albarino, partially because of the way it's vinified. And uh, the focus is more on ripe fruit. Then we move over to the Garnacha Blanca. Now, the Garnacha Blanca is my synonym for Grenache Blanc, because in fact, what we are growing is a Grenache Blanc that was introduced in 1997 from the village of Rasto in the Southern Rhone. And it's a beautiful Grenache Blanc. And true to Grenache Blanc, it's an amazing yielder, so you have to really work on, on controlling your yields to get any kind of quality out of it. But nevertheless, it is an old vine selection from Rasto. It predates the clonal program in Antov and uh, seemingly does very well for us. Uh, the vineyard where it's located is, again, the Vista Luna vineyard on these red and gravelly clay loams, ideal soils for this vigorous variety, and on 5 EB rootstock. Perhaps if I were to do it again, I'd probably put it on 101.14. Uh, the Garnacha Blanca uh, does bud break and bloom similar to Chardonnay. And I should say, now that we're getting into the Garnachas, 
The garnachas, as you've heard earlier, are very long season varieties. They start early and they end late. And so in this particular case, you see it starting with Chardonnay with bud break and, and it's not even blooming yet. Our Chardonnay has actually started to bloom. Uh, it's probably going to be in full bloom in about four or five days. The garnachas probably a few days after that, but pretty close. By the time you hit Verasion, it starts spreading out. By the time you hit Harvest, it spreads out even further. It particularly spreads out with the red version, not so much for, with the white, the Garnacha Blanca. So as you can see, our bud break is generally around the early March. Uh, flowering last year was a couple weeks early on the 6th of May, so you could imagine it's probably going to be close to like the 18th of May this year, I'm guessing. Verasion was mid-July and harvest was the uh, latter part of August, but we're probably going to be harvesting this year closer to the very last few days of August. So the canes, the Garnacha canes are, uh, they're like little dwarves compared to the Albarino. Very small inner nodes, very thick nodes and thick wood. And so you get this real stout looking vertical appearance in all of the Garnachas. On top of that, you have relatively large leaves Intense green, no pubescence, very shiny in appearance, and shorter petioles. So you have these large leaves that are stacked tight together against this very short cane, and the appearance is completely different to the Albarino. It's almost, and it makes sense, because if you think of it, these, the, you know, here you're in the southern Pyrenees up against Aragon, and you have a windblown dry condition. The Mistral winds of Rhone are called the Mastrals in Catalonia, and in that area, it's the same northerly winds, and you have these short, stout, thick cane stalks that can withstand that, and create essentially a microclimate for its fruit in a, uh, in a bush-trained vine. So now you try to put it onto a VSP, and you know, it's a pretty vigorous variety, and, but it does accommodate to a VSP. The clusters are big. They're triangular, they're large, tight, heavy, often winged, and with the Garnacha Blanca, they have this kind of lime green color to them. They're really beautiful clusters. The berries are spherical, juicy, thin-skinned, and uh, the yield per ton is high. As a comparative example, if you take a ton of Albarino with all of its seeds and thick skin, you'll get about 150 gallons per ton. With this variety, you're going to get about 170, 175 gallons per ton. Very different yields based on the architecture of the berries and the clusters. Some of the qualities that we get, and of course we've only had one vintage under our belt here, is this beautiful lemon oil and lemon rind aromatic followed by some honeydew melon and pineapple. Other descriptors that we haven't found in our wine include uh, green apple, mandarin orange, peach, and even dill. Uh, the textures, uh, if it's barrel fermented, could be very full bodied glycerol. Uh, ours is stainless steel fermented, a little untraditional. But nevertheless, uh, when you pick this, it generally leads to high alcohol wines that can have a tendency to oxidize. As a side note, in France, they use, there's more Garnache Blanc in France than there is Garnacha Blanc in Spain right now. And, and outside of the Roussillon, when you get actually into the Rhone, they use it a lot as a blender with Roussillon. So they're using some of that fattier kind of component with that steely minerality of Roussillon. Now we go on to Garnacha Tinta. Now we're getting into the reds. And with the Garnacha Tinta, we have basically three clones and one, excuse me, three selections and one clone. So uh, the first one is a 1997 introduction that came from Rasto, the very same collection that had the Garnacha Blanca. The next two were 1999 introductions. One was an introduction from the Priorat, the other one from the Rioja Baja. And then uh, in 2006, we went ahead and planted the, the uh, Hunter's Oak Vineyard with a Beaucastel clone that we purchased. So the Terra Alta Vineyard has the three selections and the Hunter's Oak Vineyard has the, um, uh, has the Beaucastel. Now, Garnacha Blanca, uh, again, it's an early, this is a very long season. It's an early season variety similar to uh, Chardonnay, similar to uh, uh, Garnacha, Garnacha Blanca, Garnacha Tinta, both are about the same. But by mid-season, by Verasion, they're kind of, uh, they're, they're with other mid-season varieties like Merlot. And by Harvest, they're out there with uh, Cabernet uh, and Petit Verdot, etc. So it really, it's a very, very long season. Despite that, the Garnacha Tinta has really good acidity. 
So very similar uh, divine architecture with a Garnacha Blanca. Again, short stout inner nodes, dense vertical growth, easy to accommodate to a VSP. The, lar the leaves are large and green and with no pubescence. The clusters are triangular again. They're tight, heavy. Uh, but they have a violet purple hue. They do not have a black hue. They have a violet purple hue. Granache has thin skins. The pigments are only in the skins. And there's good pigmentation, but not great. And for all of you who have ever grown Granache and made wine, you'll know that uh, your best friend for getting more color is using some sort of tinturier to help you out, is be it Petit Sera or otherwise. We don't do that. We like to get, well, our wines actually are like a light Pinot in color. Uh, when uh, when we finish our bottles, because we don't blend with very much else for our garnacha, but I know that most garnachas in the market are definitely aided and abetted with a little bit of creative blending with Petit Sirah, Cabernet, etc., to bump up the color. Here's a couple of pictures of garnacha. You can see the leaf is very similar to the garnacha blanca, and if you look at the variety, you can see how big those clusters are. Again, we one bud spur these varieties because there's no reason to have two bud spurs and then do some massive thinning. You know, this is a great way to lower your, your, your total tonnage initially. Then we go in there and we, we shoot thin immediately. Uh, we try to strip out any excess fruit. And we try to open up that canopy so that the fruit is exposed on the shade side. And this is very important because Garnacha Tinta, unlike the Garnacha Blanca, has issues with spring botrytis. And it has issues with collier. So what we have found, and it really stumped us initially, but what we have found is that in wet springs or where botrytis is a big issue and some of the other varieties, Semillon, Chardonnay, you will definitely find your indicator plant to be the Garnacha Tinta. You go there first to see, to see your clusters shrivel. <laughs> so uh, you, you, it, you have to really be careful about that. The other thing that it does is that if you have an exceedingly warm spring, you have a, like for example, what's about to happen right now, uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, where we're gonna get into 100 in the high 90s, what happens is you have this rapid growth and what seems to be a, uh, an inflorescence issue or a collier where the carbohydrate translocation goes through the growing, the shoot tips, the apical points, and, uh, and aborts some of the fruit. Now this very well may be a, a natural method of, 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 of fruit tonnage control that uh, allows vines that are heavy setters not to overcrop. But for whatever reasons, it, 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 we definitely see it with the Garnacha Tinta. So something to be aware of. And aside from that, uh, we do get, uh, a little, you can get a little late season bunch rot. And again, botrytis driven because you're, you're hanging out there so long. Garnacha can hang and hang and hang and the fruit flavors get better and more complex and better. And unlike, let's say, Tempranillo that loses its acid, Garnacha withholds its acid well. So if you go too far then you, and you have uh, fall rains, then you can run into the problem of getting uh, fall botrytis bunch rot. The only two other things about Garnacha that you need to know that I think are critical is um, you shouldn't have those clusters exposed directly to sun. There's a reason why they create these big leaves and these short, stout canopies. You will get sun bleaching. It's not so much sun scalding, it's more of a bleaching of the little pigment that you have. So it's very important to make sure that you have a good shade environment, particularly from heat events that we can get here in California. And the other thing is, and it'll be interesting to study if anyone does a paper on this, but magnesium deficiency in basil leaves. Magnesium deficiency, uh, has occurred to us, we see this in the very same years that Zinfandels have like magnesium deficiency in basil leaves, the Garnachas will have it too. And I don't know whether it's a temperature related thing in the soil, uh, but, but it seems to be across rootstocks. So something to consider looking at. Some of the qualities of Garnacha, and one of the reasons why it's so popular is it has this amazing strawberry aromatic. In fact, in the last Grenache Gris that we tasted, the Glen McGordy poured that it was definitely right there. It has also with that, that black cherry, raspberry, spice. And in, in those, uh, those Grenaches that are uh, aged for a while, you get this beautiful cedar component that can come out. In the flavors, you get this strawberry jam that follows right through from the aromatics. You get a little bit of quince and you can actually get some white pepper, which is really, really delicious. The texture, why is this so important? Um, Garnacha has this real juiciness about it, a real delicious, sweet, 
fruity juiciness that is not um, residual sugar. Similar to the Graciano, and not surprisingly, those two varieties are excellent blenders with those dry, dusty tannins that the Tempranillo gives you. Uh, another good thing about the, the Garnacha is, again, it retains good acidity. So when you're blending it with Tempranillo that doesn't, that's another benefit. Now we go to one of my favorites, the underdog, Graciano. Uh, we, uh, we have Graciano planted in three vineyards. The Graciano we have uh, came from somewhere in the Rioja Alavesa in 1999 as it, it was introduced to California. We got it into the Las Cerezas vineyard and we consider that our mother block. And uh, uh, from there it, we have planted it in two different vineyards and there has been a groundswell of interest for people to play around with this as a blender primarily with their Tempranillo programs and other programs. The Las Cerezas vineyard again is the fine silt loam that's in your third glass and we'll taste that in a little while. And then the Vista, the Terra Alta vineyard is the gravelly uh, red, redding soil which is in your fourth glass and we'll, again we'll taste that in a while. Now the phenology, this is late, late, late. It starts late, it ends late. And this is one of the problems with it. Uh, it is similar to Petit Syrah and Petit Verdot for harvest. It is definitely the latest of the three Iberian varieties that we're talking about today. Perhaps one variety that almost gets close would be Monastrell, but we're not talking about that today. So this is what Graciano looks like on the shoot tip. It has these absolutely beautiful copper little leaves that emerge in the springtime and then slowly dissipate. It's a unique, unique color to the, uh, to the shoot tips. The canes are medium girth, but what's interesting is that they have very thick nodes, and I think that actually causes a problem viticulturally in the field, at least with the selection that we have. It has a moderately upright growth pattern. The leaves are large, uh, moderately lobed, not intensely lobed. They're thick, they're pentagonal shaped. Uh, they have that copper color I mentioned. And the mature leaves, which you'll see in a moment, tend to have a light curling along the edges. And you're, you'll, it's an interesting, I don't know why they do that, but it's an interesting, typical look to Graciano. The clusters are large and conical. They're often with small wings. Uh, cluster sizes, like cane size, varies enormously. And then the berries are medium-sized, spherical, thick, and, and deeply, deeply colored. The pulp is not colored, the skin is colored, but it has a lot of pigment. And what's nice about it, it has this kind of black, this, this, this blue pigmentation. It really augments the complexity of the color of wines. So here you have that leaf that kind of curls along the edges. This is, I saw this in Antov Inra in France one day as Morastel. I was walking through their varietal blocks and I just pointed at that vine and, and uh, I asked Monsieur Boubal, is, there, is that Graciano? He, he just shook his head. He goes, yep, that's Graciano. I mean, it's, it's so distinctive. You can see the, uh, the cluster to the right. Uh, it's a little washed out the color, but it, if you put that up to the light, you would see no light coming through. It has a lot of color to it. Uh, we one bud spur our Graciano as well. I think I would consider two bud spurring it because it's a very, very low yielder. But it's not necessarily a low yielder because it yields low from the start. Our selection, I repeat, our selection is a low yielder because it starts as a moderate yielder and we have to thin it so many times. And why do we have to thin it? We have to thin it because on any given vine, you'll have some shoots that are twice as long as the shoots next to it. So there's a real disparity in the growth of the canopy, followed by a disparity in the flowering of the cluster. So you have this really, really long flowering period, which I think actually yields to shatter or shot berries because they're exposed for a longer period of time to inclement weather, heat events, etc. So by the time you get to verasion, you're thinning heavily to try to narrow down or minimize that, uh, that ripening zone. And then as you go along, since it's such a late ripener, uh, you will have some loss of basil leaves and you'll have some fruit that gets too exposed to sunlight. And Graciano, early on in the early stages, may benefit from direct sunlight. But after verasion, all you're going to do is get some more cooked characteristics in the fruit. So you really want that, those clusters hidden. 
So uh, at least on the sun side. So you're going to thin those clusters and there's going to be bird damage because the fruit is tasty. So by the time you bring it in, we generally are between two to two and a half ton to the acre. And we probably started at five, four and a half, five. So it's an expensive varietal to farm. Again, my selection. There may be much better selections than this one from a viticultural standpoint. And, uh, but the rewards are great. Some of the aromatics that you get are this cherry, blackberry, anise, clove, and tobacco. The flavors, you get this beautiful black fruit, uh, like blackberry and, and plum jam. Uh, you get some anise following through in the flavors. And the textures, now similar to the garnacha, but with a lot more going on, you have this really richly colored wine, blue-violet hues, not those red hues that the garnacha gives you. And uh, you have soft to moderate tannins. Now, that's in our area. In a cooler climate, you may get some much more aggressive gripping tannins, but we don't get that. We also do a, a little bit of extended maceration. But you get a sweetness and a juiciness to the variety that you'll, you'll see when you taste. And finally, the Tempranillo. The Tempranillo is a, uh, this is the Duero Tempranillo. It came from the Ribera del Duero, brought in in 1999, donated to FPS in 2001, and it is the registered FPS number 12. At the time we brought this in, there just wasn't a whole heck of a lot to look at. Now it's really exciting for everybody wanting to play with Tempranillo to see the myriad of possible clones that are coming out of FPS. And I think we're very fortunate as an industry to have not only something like Foundation Plant Service, but uh, Foundation Plant Service with a very active director that is always leaving no stone unturned to create the best collection we can so that we as an industry become the beneficiaries of, of all that. So our initial Tempranillo was again planted in our mother block, which is the Las Cerezas Vineyard. It's on 10114 rootstock. Then we went ahead and planted in the year 2000 the Liberty Oaks Vineyard, and in 2006 we planted uh, the Hunter's Oak Vineyard Tempranillo. It is a uh, you know Tempranillo, which means temprano or early, but it's not an early starter. It's a medium season starter, and it ends pretty early, so it has a relatively short phenological stages. Uh, the uh, the season around bloom time and veraison is similar to Merlot. It is the earliest of the three Iberian uh, reds that we have to be harvested. And if I throw in the Monastrella, it would be the earliest of the four. The, uh, the variety is uh, vigorous and upright, easily accommodates to almost any trellis system. We have it on a modified VSP, does extremely well. Medium to long inner nodes, medium nodes, I mean, it's really just an easy growing vine. The leaves are large and deeply lobed. You'll see a picture of it in a second. They're dark green, they're thin and wavy. They have a little bit of pubescence on the underside. The clusters are, um, they're, they're thick skinned. They have these kind of conical shape to them. Some have wings, some in some years have wings as long as the main cluster. That doesn't happen often though. And the berries are large and spherical and they hang very loosely on a vertical rachis. So you can see to the right, and that's not a real idealized picture, that's really what Tempranillo looks like. And to the left you'll see that deeply lobed uh, Tempranillo leaf. The, uh, the variety is cold tolerant. We actually planted it in an area called Coyote Creek in a, in a low spot, thinking that we would probably have problems with frost and whatnot, but you know, they said it didn't come out early and that it had cold tolerance. In fact, all of that is very true. It's a cold tolerant variety. It is used to high elevation. There is no surprise that this variety is found and does very well in the Ribera del Duero and in the parts of the Rioja known as the Rioja Alta and the Alavesa, which are the highest areas in the Rioja. It is ideally suited to that continental climb. We do shoot this thing, uh, shoot in this Tempranillo but it will have a tendency to push a lot of laterals. And in some cases, if you have it overly vigorous, it'll create these bull canes that run close to the ground. So you have to be very careful with vigor control. The first five years are very difficult to tame this vine if you're on a vigorous soil. We are on the San Joaquin clay loam at the Liberty Oaks Vineyard. And uh, in hindsight, this I would be putting this on gravelly, rocky soil to mitigate the vigor under irrigated conditions. Because one thing the Tempranillo doesn't have is it doesn't have a really good drought tolerance. 
So it's one of those things where you want to mitigate the vigor early on in the season, but since we don't have any seasonal rains in California, then you want to be able to judiciously supply water back to maintain that canopy. Uh, we drop the wings with everything that goes into our own program so that we get good coloring all the way around. Uh, the biggest problem with Tempranillo, the single largest winemaking problem, is one of the best viticultural attributes, and that is that it's a really good potassium forager. It picks up a lot of potassium, and potassium deficiencies in the canopy are generally not seen. And in California, where we have a lot of serpentinite and we have a lot of soils that have higher magnesiums, in certain areas, potassium uptake is an important issue. Tempranillo doesn't seem to have an issue with that. But by the same token, it accumulates a lot of salts in the berries, it, uh, the pH keeps rising with the rising potassium in the must, and ultimately what happens is that you end up with pretty high pHs when you bring it into the winery. Now, two years ago at the Unified Symposium, there was uh, uh, a talk on Tempranillo, and everyone on the panel had said that they were comfortable with bringing Tempranillo in with high pHs for the Californian experience. And this wasn't just Lodi, this was Mendocino, that was everywhere. And uh, some of the people mentioned pHs that range from 3.8 to 4.5 coming into the winery. So high pH winemaking, uh, if you're looking for hang time, is what you have to be comfortable with. However, that's not what we're doing. You might recall when we talked about the Albarino, we, we, we kind of threw out the door the idea of picking by flavor and starting to pick basically by bricks not having all those precursor flavors there that we wanted, we found out that wasn't an issue. Well, with Tempranillo, it'll get, again, like Garnacha, it'll hang and get more and more delicious, but at one point you have to call the shots and say, I have to bring this in, otherwise I'm gonna have a high pH, which is highly buffered. So we are actually now going to be doing a dual trial in 2009 where we're gonna be picking exclusively on um, flavor, but combined with pH. And once we hit a pH target, Regardless of the flavor, we're going to bring it in and we're going to see what happens. But it's definitely one of those learning curves that we have in here in California with Tempranillo. Another thing that happens with Tempranillo, just briefly, is that unlike the Garnacha, when you get really high sugar, you start getting this slip skin. The berries will start breaking down on you faster than Garnacha or Graciano. So something also to keep in mind for those of you who really like high sugars. Some of the organoleptic qualities. Uh, and actually, before I begin, I should let you know that you will find in the literature, now these are the flavors that we get out of our own wines, but you will find in the literature that many people have said that Tempranillo is similar to a Merlot in that it doesn't necessarily have an intense fingerprint of what it is, what characters you get, uh, Grenache, strawberry, or Graciano, blackberry, you know, or plum. What, what is it that Tempranillo gives? And it changes depending on where you plant it. So, uh, again, here, I, varietal flavors with Tempranillo are hard to pin down, similar to Merlot. You'll, you'll see that. So, um, whether that's true or not, I'm not exactly certain. I'll tell you what I've gotten out of our Tempranillos, and they're listed right here. Black cherry, strawberry, cassis. I think one of the things that we really get a lot of is cocoa. We'll get some plum, some tobacco. The vanilla really comes from the American oak that we use at about 25%. The flavors include uh, cherry and plum jam. Plum jam is a big one. Textures. Now the Tempranillo, unlike what we've been talking about earlier with the other reds, really has this silky, medium bodied, dry tannins with a very beautiful long finish. So it has a lot of elegance to it. It generally has low acidity as we talked about earlier. And this is why in many places it's blended with higher acidity wines such as again Garnacha and Graciano. So these are the two vineyards that uh, we've been talking a lot about. The one on the left, the Las Cerezas Vineyard. The one on the right, the Terra Alta Vineyard. The one on the left is located uh, perhaps three miles east of Highway 99, for those of you who uh, know a little bit about the Lodi Woodbridge area. It's pretty much in the, to just east of center of the Lodi Woodbridge AVA. Now the Lodi Woodbridge AVA is divided into seven sub-AVAs, and this particular AVA is known as the McCallamy River AVA, and it's because all of the deposits, all of the soils here are alluvium off of that river, mostly granitic based. The Terra Alta vineyard on the other hand is already getting into the Sierra foothills. This picture was taking looking down into the valley, but you can see some of the topography. It's rolling, it has blue oaks, very dry area. Uh, 
almost all volcanic mud flows from the tilt of the Sierras that have come down into the valley, uh, generally poor soils. Here's a little bit of the chemistry behind those soils. The Las Cerezas Vineyard is the Toque fine silty loam. The Toque comes from the famous grape that Lodi was famous for for about 100 years. Uh, it's a soil class number one. It's a really good soil. The color is light gray. It's about 25,000 years old. The pH is 6.8. The spacing of the vineyard is five by five. So I put this really intense, tight vineyard spacing on a vigorous site. The idea there was more on the French model to try to create a lot of competition in a high density environment to get those vines to accommodate to that space with the judicious use of water and cover crops. And we've been able to bring the vines under control with no problem. The Terra Alta vineyard is a redding gravelly clay loam. It's a class three soil, very poor soil. It's a reddish brown soil, very, very oxidized. Iron and aluminum silicates are pretty much all that's left. Uh, the age is tenfold greater than, uh, than the Toque Fine Silty Loam. The pH is significantly lower, 6.1. The spacing is eight by five, and it's within the Clemens Hills AVA, AVA, which is all those rolling hills on the very eastern part of the Lodi AVA. So you have one wine each, and please feel free to start tasting them. The first one on your left is the Las Cerezas Alberino, and the first, uh, and the second one on your left is the Terra Alta Albarino. And I think the reason I brought these different terroirs is for you to see some of the, fl the aromatics that change when you go from a younger soil to an older soil uh, and, uh, and what the soil uh, attributes to the wine. Here's some information on the Albarino as you're tasting them. They were harvested within a day of each other. August 24th for the Las Teresas Vineyard and August 25th. The bricks were almost identical, 23.2. The refract told me they were identical, but uh, by the time they were in the tank, they were a little different. And the Terra Alta Vineyard is 23.6. The pH is by far better on the Las Cerezas Vineyard. Uh, the TA is 0.47 on the Las Cerezas, the Terra Alta 0.45, not too different. We used the identical yeast, we fermented them the same way, we did everything identically so we could try to isolate what the soil was giving. We use an M2 yeast, which is typically used for aromatic whites, and we fermented between 50 and 55 degrees, slow fermentation. It took 31 days to go to dryness on the Las Cerezas vineyard, and only 21 days on the Terra Alta, which immediately tells you, here's this silty loam that's supposed to be so vigorous and wonderful, and it actually is having more nutritional issues fermenting, going through fermentation. Uh, it was all stainless steel fermented in OML. Typically what we find with these two wines is, now I should tell you that the one on the left, which is the uh, Las Cerezas, uh, won a very nice award from the Chronicle. It was named one of the top 100 wines in the United States. And I was surprised because, well, I didn't throw the award away, I'll tell you that. But I was surprised because it's in fact the, uh, the Terra Alta vineyard that in my mind is closer to, not like, but closer to what an Albarino really should be. It has a little bit more of that citrus component, it's a little more minerality, uh, and it's a little bit lighter in style. But nevertheless, and, and I would think that that's what I would have achieved on a younger, more granitic-based soil, given that Albarino is actually, uh, uh, is actually based more on granitic-based soils. Interestingly enough, though, um, uh, well, one thing I should say is the Terra Alta vineyard, chemistry-wise for the soils, if we go back, uh, is, is probably closer to what you would find in Galicia. So perhaps it's not surprising that that one should taste more like Albarino. And then when we go to the Graciano, you can see the harvesting dates are rather later. We're getting into October now. You've got the Las Teresas Vineyard, that's your third wine, and the Terra Alta Vineyard, that's your fourth wine. They were harvested, one was on the 12th, the other one was on the 2nd. The bricks were out the roof with the Las Cerezas at 27. The Terra Alta was at 25.8. Again, we're doing this all by flavor. Uh, we used a Lalamond yeast on both of them, kept the fermentation temperatures as close as we could, although definitely the Terra Alta fermented hotter by a little bit. And the fermentation days, uh, because it probably fermented a little harder, hotter, and the Terra Alta went a little bit faster, it was only 11 days till dryness as opposed to 14 days. 
it was all done in half ton bin fermenters and we did allow these obviously to go through ML. And uh, up front, the Las Cerezas is, uh, is a variety that uh, the, Gra the Graciano has always been very floral, very beautiful, very soft on the Las Cerezas. And on the Terra Alta, it tends to be a bigger, lusher, a little more tannic version of the same variety. What we found, we don't have the Tempranillo here to taste, but we found the same to be true of the Tempranillo. Where Tempranillo and Graciano and all these varieties, but particularly Tempranillo, when you put them on higher clay fraction soils, will give you more to play with. Will give you a lot more, um, similar to a Merlot. So, that concludes my talk today. And I want to thank you all for coming here. And I'm ready to take any questions. But first, before I do, Again, I want to thank the staff at FPS. I want to thank Deborah Galina, who's walking back there and did such a great job today. Nick DeCouzlian as well. Nancy Sweet, who helped organize so many things and was very, um, very, very informative with everything that I had to bring here. And I'm sure she did equally as well with everybody else. So thanks again. Any questions out there? Ah, Glenn. Okay, the uh, that's a. Do I blend these wines? Okay, the the Albarino, we have never blended to date. So it's 100% Albarino, and 100% from those distinct vineyards. And it's a good question because reading in the literature, you know, you have Trechadura and Loreiro, and they have all these wonderful varieties that are can be typical blenders into the Albarino. And uh, my thought was that in reading up and tasting some of these varieties, I think if anything, I need to have a I need to bring my varieties in, as I said earlier, to have a little more acidity and verve in the wines. And I don't know that those varieties would actually give that to me. So I need to explore that a little bit further. But simply because they blend in Galicia, in Monsao, in Portugal, does not necessarily mean that that might be the best thing for me. But until I try, I don't know. Now, getting some of that other budwood and propagating it and getting it up takes time. So we have been contemplating uh, planting some new varietals. And because of my Catalan heritage, I've got to plant Charello and Macabeo. So that's going to happen sometime. <laughs> Now, on the, um, on the red side, we do do a lot of blending, but what you have here is a 2007 Graciano that was pulled from a barrel yesterday, so there's no blending that's been done yet. This is uh, an unfinished wine. Ultimately, when we finally do the final blends, which is going to be this next month, there is going to be, uh, it's hard to say that there's going to be because we do all this blind, and every year when we do blend, particularly with our Tempranillos, Graciano has every year always made the cut. And our garnacha, for what, whatever apparent reasons, whatever reasons are not apparent to me, has yet to make the cut. And they're both juicy, forward, wonderful varieties that you think would fill the same niche in the Tempranillo, but for whatever reasons, our garnacha has never made the cut as a blender into our Tempranillo. Now, what do we blend with our Graciano? Almost always it is about five to up to 12% Tempranillo. And what it adds to the final blend is this beautiful middle, middle palette and some, uh, some tannic structure to carry out a longer finish onto the Graciano. Now, Gra Graciano's in and of themselves are very hard to find. I don't know exactly how many producers are making them in Spain, Viña y Jalba, and maybe three or four others that are actually, you know, bottle one, maybe more, I don't know. And there's a reason for that. Uh, like a lot of people don't do garnachas by themselves either. They're, they're often really great blending components. So, um, so with the Graciano, it definitely has some holes that has to be filled, and Tempranillo fills them well. Good question. Yeah. You know, I've uh, I've contemplated the idea, and every time I bring that up, my banker gets really mad at me. So. Uh, the, no, the, the funny thing about old Riojas is I would love to do that. There, there is a marketing dilemma in the United States where if we see a bottle that's on the shelf that says 2005, it's passe. You know? So there's a problem with, the, with consumer awareness. 
And uh, that's not to say that it's insurmountable, but that is an issue that, that uh, we have, you know, a library of Tempranillos that go back to 2000, and our 2002s are tasting beautifully right now. It is a long-lived wine. Uh, the 2004s equally as well. So yeah, I would love to do that and do some sort of reserva or grande reserva release. Uh, the practicality of that is perhaps when we're a little bit bigger and we can we can look at that seriously. Um, the other aspect of that though is when you look at the Riojas of old, you know, you have these new Riojas that are Riojas de Alta Expresión, that are high expression wines. And, but the varieties that we have today in the Rioja are not the same that we had a hundred years ago in the Rioja. I mean, Tempranillo was a fraction then of what it is now, and Graciano was a much bigger portion of what it is today. And so, some, uh, you know, it's an interesting evolution that Rioja has gone through. And uh, what I like to do is harken back to some of those combinations of mixes that they were doing in the 20s and 30s, and play around with that as well. So, that's a great question. I think we had a question here in the front. Uh, could you talk about irrigation on your Tempranillo? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, basically, Tempranillo, we treat it like Syrah uh, initially, which, me, which is to say that we beat it up with irrigation initially. What we're trying to do is, is really temper that vine growth at the beginning of the season. We like to actually create um, an environment of hydrologic stress, not nutritional stress, but hydrologic stress. And so we let it go to about negative 12, negative 13 bars before we start our irrigation practices, which is to say that we're probably not gonna start irrigation this year until probably the first of June. And, uh, and, and at that point, then we come back and apply water, and uh, we're changing our irrigation practices now for the months of July and August, where what we've been doing is metering water three times a week at roughly about a couple gallons, maybe three gallons. We're thinking about changing that, and that's worked very well to maintain the freshness of the canopy. I think my concern was I didn't want to bloat the berries. You'll, you'll, you'll hear a lot about Tempranillo, and if you over-irrigate it, you get the big berries, and it lowers your pigmentation, et cetera. But I think what we might do a month before harvest is really give a few deep irrigations to really try to get those roots further into the terroir and see what we can do there. And then as we get closer to harvest, uh, up to about a week before harvest, then we go back to metering small amounts just to keep the canopy healthy and fresh. So, I think we had a question in the back, and then. Okay, the Tempranillo is in fact on California state soil. It's known as the San Joaquin clay loam, and it is a soil that is characterized by about three feet of clay loam, very red in color, very red in hue. Uh, and there are different variations depending on um, uh, the, these, these are all soils that are located on river cuts that go through uh, the Kasumnas area. And so some are older than others, but nevertheless they're for the most part three feet of clay loam followed below that by a, a massive clay. So what you have is these roots go through the clay loam, they hit that clay lens, they start growing horizontally, they really don't go into it, and they wick water slowly, as long as there's water to be wicked all the way through till probably mid-July. So. We do blend Graciano into our Tempranillo. And uh, again, we don't, it varies every year on how much actually makes the blend. The highest we ever had was 12% Graciano into Tempranillo, and the lowest was 2%. And, uh, and we just will do fractions and see at what point uh, we get what we want. Uh, this year we'll begin experimenting with Monastrella's uh, component to our blending decisions as well. So there was a question. Oh, we don't. We go through ML on our red wines. Oh, I apologize. We don't do any ML on the white wines, but our red wines all go through ML. Yeah, yeah. So, any further questions? What right there? Well. Oh yeah, with Tempranillo. You know, with Tempranillo, the problem has not, so, I mean, we've never had a stuck Tempranillo. Now, so we haven't had a stuck Tempranillo, but, uh, but we have had some sluggish fermentations on other varieties. The high, but the high potassium really is an issue. Uh, what happens with Tempranillo also is you end up with a lot of malic acid. 
Okay, when you have high potassiums, you have high malic acid, and then you go through those MLs, and poof, it, you know, your, your pHs go high. And we've had some pHs go all the way up after ML to like 4.1, and then you want to correct it back so that you can you make sure you don't get any, you, you want to stabilize your wine so you don't get any VA issues or whatnot. So we try to bring it back, and sometimes we can only bring it back to about 3.8 and we just have to be happy with where it's at. And it's funny, but there's a whole group of winemakers that buy fruit from my vineyard, and we're starting a little discussion group on this. It's like, okay, wh wh where's our comfort level? And it's like, it's great to have people going through the same problem as you. It's, real, it's a support group, you know? <laughs> so uh, now with Garnacha, we have had stuff fermentations in the past on two occasions. And it's a little frustrating. It's an organic, all of our Spanish varieties are organically grown. But this particular one, uh, it, we've done a very good job at minimizing that vigor in the Garnacha, but uh, perhaps too good of a job. And so we're probably going to find some in interesting and creative ways to apply a little bit more nitrogen so that the fruit comes in a little more well-balanced so we don't get into those stuck fermentations. So. Again, thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate the invitation to speak to you here today.